Greetings, yeah. everyone. Thanks for your patience as we got everything set up. I am Chris Morgan from the Newburgh Library. Greetings, everyone. Um, let's see. Um, we just ask that everyone re remain muted. Um, and if you do need to ask a question, ask it in the chat. Um, if later on for like there's Q&A after the lecture, if you'd like to raise your hand, if you have any questions, you can use that feature. Um, let me just introduce myself real quick. I am Chris Morgan from the Newburgh Free Library. I'm the adult programming librarian. And we'd like to thank um, the city of Newburgh and Ellen Phillips with the city of Newburgh and Sylvia uh, Rivera with the Small Business Administration for orchestrating this program and uh, Miriam Bouchard with the uh, New York Small Business Development Center for teaching it. Um, so without further ado, uh, Sylvia, do you want to start or? Ellen. Ellen, okay. Oh. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Ellen Fillo, uh, Director of Community Development with the City of Newburgh. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this wonderful uh, Business Basics Boot Camp. Uh, we thank uh, Newburgh Free Library, uh, the SBDC, and our co sponsor of this program, which is Small Business Administration. And uh, we look forward to a wonderful program. And I'll pass it off to Sylvia. Hey, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We are really looking forward to sharing this information with you to help you get started, to help you become entrepreneurs and help you get started in making all this wonderful money and building our economy. And thank goodness that we have our resource partners who always assist us. We have the certified business advisor, Ms. Miriam Bouchard, who will begin momentarily. Lady Miriam, it's for you. Good evening, everyone. I will be a presenter for tonight and for the duration of this series. Um, and this session is recorded, so you'll be able to listen to it again. You'll be sent the link. And I will also send you the PDF of this PowerPoint. And um, you will also, um, yeah, so you'll be able to, and you'll have my contact information. So you'll be all set. So <clears throat> the Small Business Bootcamp was born out of the desire to unite um, the needs of the local folks um, that want to have basic information on how to start a business. So um, the SBDC, who I work for, and the SBA, our sponsors, and the City of Newburgh and the Newburgh Free Library partnered together to create this um, foundational sessions. So um, I work for the Mid-Hudson Small Business Development Center and we are funded by the SBA. We, as a result, offer no cost business counseling to new or existing businesses. And in New York, in, we have a particular um, extra uh, service for you as clients of the SBDC. If you need research, business research, we have specialists, business librarians that can do research for you in any shape, fashion, form. So let's say you're writing a business plan and you need to get industry data that from databases that you cannot afford, the, our librarians might have access to it and then they can pull that information for you. Um, so if you go to our website, the nysbdc.org, there's a ton of information there. And there's also a link, which I will also email to you. Um, so you can, um, if you want, apply for one-on-one -on -one business counseling. <clears throat> so I'm your presenter. And we're going to have four sessions. Tonight, we're reviewing how to start a business. Um, in two weeks, we're going to review new business trends in the pandemic because I felt it was important to see how some industries are pivoting, the challenges of some industries, and also, um, if you have a business idea, these reviewing these business trends might help you formulate your idea a little better given the times we're in. Um, it's not business as usual for a lot of folks, so this is a good place to expand our knowledge and thinking. I think the most important session of this whole uh, series I'm biased, I love numbers. Um, it's to learn how to do a feasibility analysis. What that means is if you are, um, if you have a business idea, it doesn't matter what it is, 
I'll show you how to put it in numbers so that you can see how much money you would need. Um, is this going to work? So um, it's a very, very important tool. Oops, sorry. Going forward. Um, the last session is about marketing and sales because it doesn't matter what business you need, you need marketing and sales. So um, it's a pretty good overview of many, um, many topics. So tonight we are going to review um, this funding process and business plan and the types of legal entities. So it's a lot of information. Uh, you're welcome to take some notes. If you have questions, you can raise your hand you can uh, use the chat box. There will be moments where I will ask, does anyone have any questions before moving on to the next topic? Um, but if I see that it's something that I will cover, I will just say, I'll talk about it later. I'll, I'll just um, sadly ignore your question with the thought that it will be answered in, in my presentation. So, um, <clears throat> so if you're starting a business, you most likely need money very, very um, rarely are there any business models of businesses where you don't need any money. And I'm not saying that it's impossible, it's just rare. I mean, if you're turning a hobby into a business, you probably have all you need for the trade and you may not have to invest as much, but for a true business, um, you will probably need to invest some funding. So what are the different sources? Um, usually you will need to invest some of your savings um, and you'll need to, to put a little bit of meat into the funding pool. So um, having savings will help. Having collateral is extremely helpful, especially if you're going to um, need to borrow more than a certain amount, which usually lenders, you know, over 10, 15,000 will want to find a way to secure their loan. They're really in the business of getting their money back. Um, so they want to make sure that their money is going to be secured in some shape, fashion, form. Um, then the second closest space where you can get money is from friends and family. Especially when you're starting your first business, it's really, um, it, it, it's twofold. One is these are people that trust you, that believe in you, that know you. And if you go to a lender um, thereafter and you say, well, I've invested this much of my own money, my friend's family have invested this much. It's a, um, it's a show of character, which I will talk about later. It talks about who you are as a person and it's, it's very telling to the lenders in, in that sense. Next are um, lending institutions, of course, bank, credit unions, and I'll review what they will require, which is pretty extensive in terms of documentation and preparation. Alternatively, um, you can always try crowdfunding, which, there are, which we'll talk about later, but these are um, for projects where you may have a good that you can um, put in your crowdfunding campaign, or uh, you may have a service, that, and then you target probably locals. But there's really, um, you know, for a startup in this area, um, these are the most common sources of funding. Any questions? questions. I think you can unmute yourself if you have a question. Okay, I'll move on. So if you go to a traditional lender, <clears throat> they will review, uh, they'll have like a bunch of boxes they're going to check off. And um, one of them is going to be you. Who are you? Do you have experience in the field? Um, are you prepared for this business? So the part in the business plan, which I'll review later, that talks about who you are, you really have to spruce it up. You really have to like not be shy. Oftentimes I say, find somebody who knows you well to write it for you. 
and they uh, will not be shy in saying how great you are and that you are, you know, the best person to run the show. Um, it's very um, important that you have experience. I had a client once who wanted to start um, a dog kennel. And we pretty much reviewed all the things you're going to review tonight in our one-on-one -on -one session. And then at the end, I say, so how many dogs do you have? And she says, well, I don't have a dog. I'm like, what do you mean you don't have a dog? Did you ever, did you ever have a dog? And she's like, nope, never had a dog. And then I was like, um, all right, you need to have a dog. You need to have a dog, learn if you're a dog person, learn how to train a dog so that when you have a kennel with 20, 30 dogs, you know how to, to handle the dogs and the dogs know that you can handle them. That was her first homework. And when she was raided by land and put up a building and I said, you don't even know if you like dogs. See if you like dogs. So um, then if you're going for a, a traditional loan, you will need to put uh, generally at least 25% of your own cash. So. Um, that's why it's important to look at your cash reserve and, and see if your friends and family can pull into that if you don't have enough, but they will want to make sure you have a substantial stake into the um, financial part of this business. And if you're asking for a, an amount, usually lenders are not really that interested in a small loan because, well, they make no money out of it. And it's the same amount of work as a large loan. And usually when you're starting a business, you'll need a fair amount of money. So um, they will want a way to secure the loan. If you're looking to buy equipment, like I have a, ga a glass blower uh, client who's looking to buy a big machine and that's like $50,000. A lender will use that piece of equipment as collateral to secure the loan, which means that they will put a lien on that piece of equipment so that it cannot be sold unless that loan is paid back. And alternatively, if the client, if their client does not pay the loan, they will take that piece of equipment and sell it. Oftentimes for equipment, they don't give you 100%. Um, it's a little bit like a car, it loses value quickly, but they uh, will also use collateral from your home if you have any, um, if you have any equity in your property. Then they will look to see that you have capacity to repay the loan. So what does that mean? It means that they want to make sure you can pay the loan. And the way you do that is by giving them projections that are believable. This is the third session that we're going to, when we're doing the feasibility analysis, we're basically building projections and seeing if our scenario works. And it's very telling. Numbers tell a story, which is why I love numbers. And they, um, they tell you how many um, widgets you need to make or, or uh, sell. They tell you um, how much money you will need to make it work, to start and to get it to a point where you break even. So there's a lot of um, stories that are told with the projections. And they will want you to make believable projections. And by that, um, I had once a client who was a graphic designer and she took a, some sort of program online and they, the program asked a few questions and then it showed that by year two, she was making three millions in sale. And I'm like, what, how did they come up with that number? She said, well, I don't know. They just asked him questions and she had no idea where that number came from. Well, the way I'll show you the, I'll teach you this is going to be um, fact-based so that you can explain it to a lender. You can explain it to a friend and family if they're looking to invest in your business. And then um, very important to have good credit. You need at least 650 and above, ideally 675. Um, I gave uh, a whole presentation a couple of days ago on how to improve your credit. Um, that's a whole story. I mean, it's a whole hour, so I'm not gonna get into that tonight, but it's really important that you have good credit because even though um, the business is you, so if you can't handle your own finances, 
um, the chances are you won't be able to handle the business finances well either. Conditions have to do with things that are out of your control. For example, right now, um, the, the lenders have in their portfolio uh, restaurants that are you know, really suffering. So if you're starting to, if you're looking to start a restaurant and you're going to see a traditional lender, chances are they're going to say not good conditions right now. Even though you are the best chef or have found the best location, at a discount and, and all, you know, everything from your end line up from an, uh, an outsider, the conditions are not good. So conditions are out of your control. You, you have some leverage in your business plan to, to describe that they're good for you, but in general, um, conditions are out of your control. So if you check off all of these C's and you are um, you are in good shape. A lot of people have one or two, maybe three of those checkoffs. So then that tells you what you need to work on. I will say, I, I will always say to anyone, including you, never give up on your vision. It will just take time. So sometimes it just takes a little longer than we think. So um, if you go to the lender, they'll want to see a business plan, financial projections. Like I said, we're doing this March 11. And tonight we're going to review what goes into a business plan. And I will also send you uh, a template so that you can use a template, a very simple template that follows these, um, these headings. So far, so good. Any questions, anyone? Like I said, if you have a question in the chat and I ignore it, it's because I will talk about it later. I'm not ignoring you. Okay. I'm just not jumping the gun here to answer questions that will be answered later. Um, so a business plan is basically a story, right? It's a story that 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 document becomes your um the the basically the the person that, that will read it will will have the same story to read as the next person over and the underwriters and everyone else. So it's basically becomes a document that is um, a, a living document because it's never etched in stone. Honestly, the minute you're done with your business plan, it's obsolete because things will already have changed. So you have to understand that a business plan is never, ever complete. You're always changing things. So, um, but if you're looking to write a business plan, most people write it because they need funding. And the first thing the lenders will want to see is why, why do you need funding? So in the first, you know, just in a few lines, you explain why you need funding. Usually you incorporate some numbers from your um, projections so that you can explain how much money you need from the lender and what will it be used for. So it's a very simple um, little statement. Then they'll want to see what, what type of business, what are you going to do? Don't tell your life story. And if you say it once, put it in the right place. So don't, this is not where you talk about your experience that goes in management. This is not where you talk about marketing that goes into marketing. So description of a business is basically what it is, what type of legal entity, what are you going to do? Again, a few lines, a paragraph, bullet points, keep it simple. The reader will understand what you're saying. And if you ever write a business plan that's 40 or 50 pages, I will never read it. The business plan, unless you're a technology company that has patents and been in business for 20 years and need to explain to me certain things, um, I don't want to see more than 10 pages. So um, that's why you want to keep it short. You can you want to keep it sweet. You want to say it once. Don't use a template off the internet. They're terrible. They're completely redundant. They're going to ask you the same question in different manners three times so that it looks like you have a lot to say, but you know, 30 pages of saying nothing is not any good to you. So might as well leave it at 10 and have good content. Next, you will describe the location. So if you don't have a location in mind, or if you don't need a location, uh, if you don't need a location, you skip that. You just say, 
uh, it will be a virtual business and I don't need a location. But if you have, um, if you need a location and you don't have a specific location in mind, you can describe in there, um, I need 2000 square feet, uh, parking spaces for eight cars, uh, playground area space, um, and I want to be not too far from a busy road or within the 10 mile radius of this town. So there are lots of ways to fill that um, category without, um, even though you don't know what, where you're going to go. If you have a specific location in mind, this, this is where you put all the details. And this is where you also want to talk about um, your neighborhood, what is found within your neighborhood, and um, why you think it's a good location. And then this is um, a section that some people struggle because they don't have a good understanding of the market. Well, how large is the market? Um, what are the industry trends? Um, who are your customers going to be? Who's your target market? It's not everyone. It's a very specific person, either by gender, age, geographic area, uh, income level, it's, it's uh, shopping trends that they may have. So you really need to know who that client is of yours. And very importantly, you wanna study the competition because um, if I'm looking for whatever service, goods, I will compare your business with others. So you want to know what you're being compared to. It's very important that you study the competition. If you're, you know, just making this up, if you're starting um, a bagel shop and within your town, there's another bagel shop, you may want to go sit, you know, across the street in your car and count how many people go in and out. Uh, you may want to try the place. You may want to compare notes. You may want to look at reviews on, on Yelp or on Google. Uh, you may want to follow their page on Facebook or Instagram and see what people are saying. Just study them because you will be compared to them. Um, it's very important to know who they are so you know how you position yourself. So um, marketing strategy, sadly, is usually this very the smallest section that I see when it's even there of business plans. People don't understand marketing, which is why the last session is about marketing and sales. So it's very important because if you don't market yourself um, in the business and order business, sometimes you are the business because you're, let's say, offering, you know, acupuncture or whatever. Um, if you don't know how to market yourself, you're not, it's nobody's going to knock on your door because they won't even know you're there. So you need to establish a strategy. If you know your customer base, um, much, much easier to know how to market your goods or services, um, which is why earlier I said you have to understand who's your target market. And this is where our um, librarians, our business librarians can come in handy. If you need industry data, um, they can pull that for you. Um, so with marketing strategy, you can have, you need, you'll need a budget and you'll need to stick to that budget within the business plan narrative. So for example, if you say that in your business plan, in the marketing strategy, strategy section that you're going to put billboards. And when we're doing financial projections, you have an allowance for your marketing strategy um, of $150 a month. I'm going to tell you, uh, no, we are not putting billboards up because <laughs> they're about $1,000 a month. So you really need to blend um, a marketing strategy that works with your budget. And um, with that, I also see that most um, companies, existing organizations that are struggling financially, the first thing they cut is marketing. Now, I want you to tell me if that makes any sense. I'm not talking about pandemic times, that's different. I'm talking about normal times when if things get, get a little tight, 
they will cut marketing because that's one expense they have some freedom over. Well, I have to tell you right now, if you need more customers because your sales are down, you don't cut marketing, you invest in marketing. So just remember that. You need to understand where you position yourself in terms of your pricing strategy. Uh, many, 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 many moons ago, if, um, like 30 years ago, I started a group family daycare. I was a single parent. I had two little kids. And the way I priced um, my daycare services was a little higher than the other group family daycare in the area, but a little lower than the daycare centers. And the way when people would ask me, would call and say, so, you know, how much it is per week for a toddler? And I would tell them, I would explain that without saying this is my pricing strategy i would just say i guarantee to not um raise prices for two years we keep a low ratio lower than what is required by um department of health actually it's department of services and we also have a preschool program and what i did is i was adding the i was putting value to that investment and you have to have clarity of where you position yourself with your product or service in the marketplace and with your competitors. One of my clients is, um, I was saying like is a glass blower and um, he makes these beautiful pieces that he sells, um, you know, at a, at a good price, a uh, good price as in like, you know, he makes, he makes a, a fair amount of money, but he also, notices that some of his competitors are selling same similar wares even though each, each piece is unique as you probably uh, know that um, but they're selling it for more so he's thinking well am i pricing my goods in the right place given the marketplace and given the art that i bring and the quality that i bring and the uniqueness that i bring in my in my goods another example is um at uh, one point I had a bike manufacturer client. Uh, he was making uh, custom bikes and um, mountain bikes, believe it or not, is a big deal. Um, people will spend thousands of dollars for a frame. I'm saying like there are no wheels on it, it's just a frame. And um, he was also selling some of those wholesale to, um, to bike shops. And he would go to trade shows and he would say, I don't understand that this competitor of mine has a, not as good of a product as I have. And he sells it for more than I do. And he's selling, he's selling these like hot cakes. And it's not as good as a product as mine. And I said, well, you know, by pricing it less than his, the message you're telling people is that it's not as good. And I, it took two years to raise his prices slowly so that the bike, the same bike that was that he was competing against, you know, similar with another competitor, he rose his prices so they were higher than his, same bike, uh, and then he started selling them like crazy. So pricing strategy is an art form, but it's also a science, and you really, really have to think about, about it before... Um, before you make a decision. And my line is always, it's easy to go down, it's very hard to go up. So if you start, you know, at a price point um, that is a little high, you can always go down and give discounts to, you know, veterans, uh, military families, whomever that you want to. Then um, lastly, we have uh, management and personnel. Who are the people that you will need to hire or that will be working with you. Who are you? Uh, why are you the best person to run the show? And you write a narrative and you also include resumes. So if you're going to create jobs, this you don't have to have people lined up, but you certainly need to understand what roles they will have, what, what job description and how much you're thinking of paying them and how many hours you will need them for. Any um, questions, anyone?
you're welcome to raise your hand or. Uh, Miriam, I see there is one in the chat and it talks about what is the, com the common pros and cons for crowdfunding. Which, which is something I will talk about later in a little bit. For the business plan, if anyone has any questions, um, this now is a good time. Yes, uh, someone asked, is there a template for the business plan? Yes, and I will email it to you. It follows those categories. It has an example um, using a bike shop, so it's easy to understand. So I will, I will send this to you um, later. So in addition to the business plan, um, you will need to provide a lot of documentation. Lenders, traditional lenders, will want to see um, your taxes, personal taxes. Um, they'll want to see, of course, your resume. And if you are um, leasing a space or equipment, if you have any contracts, uh, they'll want to see that. And they'll want you to fill out a personal financial statement. That is basically a, a portrait of where you are financially. So it, in there, you talk about the monies you owe. So whether mortgage, car payments, uh, credit cards, whatever else, and then the money you have, which could be um, you know, savings, uh, retirement, investments, anything that you may have. So that's basically um, a little snapshot of your personal financial life. If you have uh, renovation costs, they will want to see uh, not just what you think it's going to be, but they'll want to see an estimate from a contractor. And um, if you need to purchase initial inventory, especially you know if you're starting a restaurant and, and so on and so forth, your initial inventory might be substantial. Um, you may need to include the, some details of where that 15,000 is going to go. Uh, same thing with equipment purchase. Don't just say I need 5,000 for equipment. If you need two air conditioners and a refrigerator and um, whatever else you may need for your business, you have to spell it out and you can even pull out some quotes so that they understand that the number you came up with is a real number. Even though you're not going to buy that unit in particular, you are going to benchmark with that one. So um, if you are in art or fashion, someone is asking, do you think lenders will want to see your work on your portfolio, uh, clothing, accessories that you want to sell? They may not need details. Photos might be fine. Uh, this can go to, into an appendix. Um, and I'll always remember one of my pride and joy is having a client that literally did a, um, a 20, well, 15 to 20 page document when she was starting her business, but there were 150 pages in supporting documents. She had everything from, you know, uh, the decor to the types of, of, of paint that were going to be used because they wanted it to be green. So yes, I mean, the, the lenders, will decide whether or not they want to read the details of your um, supporting documents. But if it's there, it's showing that you've done your homework. Um, and if you're creating a food product like a sauce or anything like that, nothing stops you from bringing that. You know, if you, they, they will not have uh, any objections into trying your special sauce, literally. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can have photos, but you can also include, um, bring the real deal. Just looking at the next question. Um, the question is, is this information typically, typically shared digitally or on paper? It used to be on paper and now it's mainly digital. So 
So we looked at the traditional way of getting funding. Um, now we're going to look at some non-traditional ways of um, getting funding. And um, crowdfunding is really, um, really an art form. Um, but I'm going to answer this one question first, which somebody says, do you recommend using it using a CDFI over a traditional bank? And the question is yes, use the, the local bank, of course. Um, and definitely, um, you know, credit unions, you know, your, your local CDFI absolutely are worthy institutions to um, ask money to. Um, if you are, okay, this is a good question. Um, if you, if the, the, the question isn't formulated cor correctly, but it basically asks um, if we have a certain product, uh, do we need to get FDA approval first? And to this, I will say yes. No one will lend you money unless you have done your due diligence. So for example, I have a client who's looking to start um, an outdoors water spa. It's a really big project. And I said to them, you're not going to any club, you're not getting near lender until the town approves it completely. So this has been now a six months process, process and they're nearing the end of that process. But the reality is no lender will want to get, you know, will look at your project unless you have some sort of approval. So if you need um, FDA approval, absolutely get that first because no lender is going to get near you unless you need, you know, unless you have that. Um, so just be mindful that if you need any certification, any stamp of approval by any organization, um, you'll need to get that first. So, um, yeah, you can have your, you can have, somebody's asking, should we have um, photos of, you know, and document, supporting documentation, like in, a, in the back of the business plan, as exhibits, so as to not to mess the flow with the business plan. And it really depends, you know, if these are photos that are enhancing the value of your business plan, like I have a tea manufacturer and within the business plan, we incorporated some photos of their manufacturing pant and of some, you know, teas and things like that. And it just um, enhanced their business plan. Um, if you want to make a separate document as your exhibits, you can certainly do that. You can convert it as a PDF. Um, and then you have a really nice, you know, two nice distinct document. You have your business plan and you have your supporting documents. I like your questions. Um, the question is, do these lending steps apply for pur purchasing an established business? Well, that is almost a different topic of a conversation only because um, I'll be happy to bring that up if we have time at the end. Um, I'm writing it down so you can, we can revisit that at the end because it's similar in nature, but in addition, you'll need to have, actually I can answer it now. Um, um, you can, it, it's all the things I've said thus far are valid even when you're buying an established business. In addition, they will want to see a couple of things. They'll want to see tax returns. They'll want to see um, like signed tax returns. Um, otherwise they will consider this a new business. If you cannot get history from the business you're buying, they will consider this a new, a new business and it will be a lot harder for you to get funding. So that number one. Number two, um, they will want to know what you're spending money on. So if, for example, you're buying a restaurant and um, they're asking, I don't know, like $300,000, um, it's probable that they'll have about $150,000 uh, between equipment and um, their tables and everything else and some inventory. Um, but they may have, um, eval you know, put a value on the business, what's called goodwill, that um, is can be um, mathematically figured out. 
by a dozen different ways that uh, an astute uh, CPA or or uh, business valuation specialists can do for um, a fair amount of money. But a lot of times it's an emotional um, number in the sense that this is what they believe it's worth. And um, the lenders will not give you money, will not fund goodwill because it's, it's not a tangible. So when you're coming in with the idea of purchasing an existing business, you have to be prepared to justify the purchase price. So I hope that answers that question. When getting money from a credit union, or I will say from any bank, what is the average interest rate and time to pay off debt? That depends on what they will use as collateral. So if they're using um, equipment, it can be six to eight, seven, eight years, um, depending on the piece of equipment. Some really big pieces um, that are really expensive. For example, my, my tea manufacturer is buying equipment that are like literally a, a million dollar per machine. They get 15 years to pay it off. Um, if they're using real estate as collateral, they could go up to 20 years, but it's, it really depends on how much money and it really depends for what purpose and what is used as collateral. And interest rates right now are historically low. Um, they're never going to be this low, I believe. This is like a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, I think business loans are like five, 6% right now, which is like nothing. Will you be talking about trademark, copyright of a prototype and all that? Not in this session and not in these sessions. Um, I'd be happy, you know, if, if you become a client of the SBDC, uh, your advisor can review that with you. But it's such a specific topic that does not, um, it's not like a general topic of interest for all or many. You need to provide how many tax, how many years of tax returns do you need to provide? Usually it's three. So if you're looking to get a loan now, like soon, get your 2020 taxes done because they're not going to give you money until they see those taxes done. So the closer you are from taxation, the you know, and they have to wait for it, it will create delays. Uh, this meeting, this session has been recorded. So anybody that came in late can listen to it later. All right, I think we're I'm all caught up in the questions. Thank you for asking questions. I really like that because you know, in a classroom setting, you'd be raising your hand on I call on you. So this is this is important for you. I really want these sessions to be interactive so that you guys get the most of it. Okay, back to the topic. Crowdfunding. What is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding is um, usually done through some sort of platform. And there are different uh, types of platforms and different types of crowdfunding. Um, you have donation-based crowdfunding, which means people donate to you and don't expect anything in return. They're just there to help you out. Um, then there are the rewards-based crowdfunding, which is basically um, they're giving you a little more than what they're getting as a reward, but the reward is an incentive for them to give you something. Um, so if you're looking to build a prototype of sorts, um, you can offer this prototype, but it's not discounted. If anything, it's a little inflated um, because you, they're giving you money to manufacture it and make it. So the value behind them um, supporting you is that they're going to get, you know, the first ones right out the line of manufacturing and they think it's a cool project and they want to support it. Um, and then there are equity-based crowdfunding, people that will want to invest in your business with the thought that they're going to get money in return. So this is the least... Um, you know, familiar, the first two are the most familiar crowdfunding. Um, so the different platforms um, mean that there are these websites that have been created just for that. The same way you have, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook that are social media. Well, you have, you know, Kickstarter 
that is a crowdfunding platform that really focuses, for example, on creative arts. But they also have some science projects. They also have some STEM. I mean, if you explore the crowdfunding um, method to fundraise for your business, you really want to be familiar with what they offer, what each crowdfunding platform that you're exploring do, so that to make sure you're a good match. And they will tell you, you know, they will say, this is a crowdfunding platform for these sort of things. If you're way off, you know, the left field and you don't really um, are not a good fit, you probably should not use that platform. Um, everybody's heard of GoFundMe. It is a great um, fundraising platform. It's you, you keep what you raise type of funding. They don't have any fees. Um, usually these are small amounts. Kickstarter can go in the tens and hundreds of thousands, um, but GoFundMe usually are small amounts. Um, again, go look. You can, they have these word search and location, you know, they have like search, um, you can search by location, by topic, and you can see who else or what else is being raised on that platform in a similar fashion than you, and how are they faring, and how are they doing, and how are they doing it? Um, there are very, some specific funds, like this one is, is for women-led startups. There are literally dozens and dozens of crowdfunding platform, um, and there's even, you um, a WeFunder, it's a platform, but it also have resources for startups. So it's really the sky's the limit. There's so much, it's just crazy. Kiva is a type of crowdfunding that is a mix of loan and crowdfunding. And what that means is, and I've had a couple of clients who've used this very successfully. Um, their first round, I haven't checked lately, but the first round usually is 4,000. So if you just need a little bit, this is a good mix because they will give you 2000 as a 1%, 0% loan if you are able to raise 2000. So you basically raise 2000, they give you two as a loan that you need to pay back, but at 0%. So you, you get 4000, you only repay two. So it's a pretty good um, deal. And then if you successfully do that, you can go back, I think for 10. So Kiva started, in India, they were giving microloans of like $25 to women to help them start um, their business. Now, $25 in India is like, you know, thousands of dollars here. So it was enough for them to get whatever material they needed uh, or piece of equipment they needed uh, to get started. And then this grew and came to the US in a mixed loan and crowdfunding platform. So the thing, the art form with crowdfunding because it is an art form, is that um, you really have to follow the steps. You have to have a story, okay? So for example, um, I had a client who had a cafe that um, she focused on giving heavily discounted and often free um, meals to veterans. So, when the pandemic hit, she was already operating a very, very thin, mar thin margin. And when the pandemic hit and she had to close, um, you know, despite the different programs that were around and available, she was still short when it was time to reopen months later. So the story behind her crowdfunding was that she had started this cafe after her son, uh, who was in the Navy, had gotten killed. And that was her way to turn um, her grief around. She started at cafe and her way to give back to the military families uh, was to, you know, give discounts to them. And like I said, for the veterans, it was like heavily discounted and mostly free. So that was her story. And she wanted to go back to opening the cafe and you know, getting all their arrears and rent and getting her supplies and everything. So um, she had a story to tell. It was a good story, right? Um, and you wanna offer some, if you're reward-based crowdfunding, you wanna offer some good rewards, you know? So she was offering, well, hers was donation-based actually, to use that 
as an example, she was asking people to donate and they were donating towards a cause. So it would be like a meal for two or a meal for, or, or two meals or whatever. Um, so if you have um, another client I helped, um, he had a STEM product. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and he added an A, arts and math. So STEAM, he had a STEAM product. And um, part of the support was to um, provide a little kit. People could give money for a little kit that they could then assemble at home. And, um, and they had, there were different levels of rewards um, and different sizes of kits. And it was very successful. He, he met his, you know, his, he actually exceeded his goal limit, goal, um, financial goal. So if you have a good story and you have great rewards, you will attract people that are interested. You also want to set a funding goal that is realistic, which is really what you need. Don't put 5,000 if you need 10 and don't put 20,000 if you need 10. Just put the amount that you need. If you exceed it, it's great, but you really need to meet it, which is most important thing. And you really need to engage. Your backers have giving you their trust, their money. They want to know um, what you're up to. So it doesn't have to be daily. That's a little much. It could be weekly if there's a lot going on, but definitely monthly. You want to give through the platform. Usually you can send updates that appear both on your page and um, so that new investors, new supporters, uh, or commonly called backers, can come um, and take a look at your profile and then they'll see your updates. And everybody that backs, that backs you um, can get an update in their inbox email. So it's, it's important to, um, I mean, you, you know, and your backers, like I've backed projects that I did it because it was interesting to me to back that project. Usually is I give small amounts to multiple little projects um, at any given year. And when I say small amount, I mean like 20. And I normally don't want anything in return. And if they start giving me too many uh, updates, it's just annoying to me. So I just want, you know, I you can unsubscribe. So don't annoy your backers, but inform them. Um, here's a really good question. Can money raised via crowdfunding be used as capital to secure a loan from a lender? So, um, so this is a tricky question. You can use the crowdfunding uh, monies as a way to, to sort of, it's a basically um, a character-based uh, proof of concept here. It's like, hey, I needed a hundred thousand. I raised fifty through crowdfunding. Would you give me? Would you lend me another fifty? So what this is saying is that you say, "Hey, three hundred backers or five hundred backers gave me some monies," um, and it's telling a story to the lenders. They're like, "Gee, you know, that's a lot of people that put faith into this project." So they may be interested in investing, but a traditional lender, like I've explained earlier, will most likely want to have collateral. So you don't want to use the crowdfunding monies to as security for a loan. Why would you want to do that? Right? So there's no when you in, in that question, it, it basically is saying if you use the crowdfunding money as capital to secure a loan, you're basically taking free money and turning it into money that you'll need to owe with interest. So it makes no sense to me. So no, you wouldn't do that. You, it doesn't really make much sense. Um, so when you're crowdfunding, you are telling the world your secret sauce, right? You're saying, this is what I'm gonna do. This is what it looks like. This is special. This is unique, whatever it is maybe that you're doing. And it's public. So how can you protect your idea um, from others to replicate? 
And the answer to that is nothing. You're putting yourself out there. Um, nobody can really, um, you know, you're not really stopping anyone from mimicking what you're doing. You can't really do that unless you've taken some other protections, which like I said, we can't talk about right now because we don't have time. But the, 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 the bottom line is that you are exposing yourself to um, having somebody take your idea. And um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, how would crowdfunding be reported on taxes? I believe um, it might need, it, it may be taxable income unless you're not for profit. So um, you would need, but you know, if you're using that money to manufacture something, you're using it to build something, you would not be um, making money basically, right? So that would not be necessarily taxable income. I hope this answers those questions. Very important. If you are um, promising something, right? Whatever it may be in your campaign, you're promising something. Fulfill your promise because otherwise it's a stain that will stay forever. It's the internet. You can't get rid of that. It will be there. People will find it. So make it work, make it happen, um, go through the process so that you have a good story. So um, Sylvia is stating here kindly that we have um, the SBA, the Small Business Administration will guarantee loans to lenders for startups. And this is a way for lenders to minimize the risk that they take on a new business. Um, but she's also saying, and, and for real, it, it doesn't mean because the SBA will guarantee loans to the lender that the lender will want to give you a loan. It's just, um, they will still go through their due diligence. They will still go, you know, through their, they'll check their boxes, but it just, it makes it a little easier for you as a borrower um, to get money if you're considered a bit of a risk from the lender's perspective. And they will require all the things that we discussed earlier, you know, business plan, financial projections, taxes, blah, blah, blah. So before we move on to the next um, subject, I've literally been talking nonstop for an hour. Um, I'd like to know if you have any questions um, regarding the funding process, the things I've covered thus far, or things I may have not covered that you have questions on. This is a good time. You can either use the chat box, or um, raise your hand, or even unmute yourself if you need. So far, so good. Everyone awake? This is a lot of information, okay? I, I understand this is a lot of information, um, but it answers a lot of questions, I hope, that you may have. Okay, so um, usually, oftentimes, people get their legal entity before they even do anything else. And the reason I've put it at the end of the presentation is that it should really be something you do when you are sure of what you're going to do. And there are a lot of considerations. And I always say, talk to your CPA first and then talk to an attorney. The reason why you, you wanna to talk to an accountant first is that there are some taxation issues that 
are uh, different from like legal entity to the other, and you want to know what these are. Um, and you may you may not think about it now because you're starting a business, but there are different vehicles for um, say for retirement funds, right? You want to you you want to have options and. When you talk to your financial advisor, you want you may want to say, well, listen, if this is successful, I would like to start a retirement fund for myself. Is this the right legal entity for me? And what are my options if I have this legal entity versus the other? So very, very rarely does anyone ask this question when they're starting a business because, well, it feels so far down the road. But it's a good question to ask because I've had clients who had to change legal entities midway and it's just a headache. It's really a headache. Um, it's, it's really just a headache. So if you have that in place, then you know you will um, get that answer, you know, question, question answer. Um, I will not talk about how to file taxes. I don't talk about that in general only because I'm not an accountant. I'll, I always refer to the specialist. Um, taxation is, is complex. Uh, there's a lot that goes in it. I can give you pointers when we're going to do the projections because a lot of what we're going to do in the projections is going to reflect um, a budget that when you open your business is going to be you know, a, um, basically a, um, a profit and loss that you will then present to your accountant for taxes. So you can, um, we can talk about, you know, taxes then, but I really don't talk about how to file taxes ever, usually. I'm not an accountant. Um, so the most, simplest form um, of legal entity is the sole proprietorship. Because um, it can be filed at the county clerk's office for about $30. You need to have, um, you know, a photo ID and um, they will notarize your business certificate on location, um, also called DBA or doing business as. So, you know, um, Miriam Bouchard, I had a DBA as Magic Garden Preschool and Daycare. Um, I had a lot, a multitude of DBAs. I'm not going to go through the list, but it's basically, um, it's a very easy form of legal entity. And I'll talk a little bit more about pros and cons once I review the others. Um, yeah, so all you need is a photo ID so they can notarize it, $30 cash, and they'll, um, you leave with your business certificate and you can go to the bank and open a bank account. So um, there's a little more to it than this. In general, I say, um, go to the IRS website, irs.gov, and get your employer ID number, even if you're not going to hire anyone. You want that number to be the identity of the business, not your social security number. So I usually say, get your DBA, go to irs.gov, get your employer ID number or EIN, and then uh, go to the bank and open a business bank account um, and you're set to go. Literally it takes a day and you're in business. So in the same line, if you're two people and you want to um, do a general partnership together, you can also get a business certificate or doing business as partners. So in this instance, it, this, this, this certificate has to be notarized by both partners. So either you're both present or you get the form, get it notarized and then bring it to the county clerk's office. Um, but it will require um, notarized signatures by both partners. Um, again, same thing. This, because it's a partnership, you will absolutely need to get an employer ID number because you're two people. 
So in order to, for the general partnership to have its own identity, you need to get, as a number, you need to get the EIN um, number um, because you're a general partnership. So um, another type of legal entity is an S corporation. I'm not going to go to the C corporation. It's, these are publicly traded companies. This is not something part of the topic of this discussion today, but there is um, subchapter S corporations, which a lot of people um, choose to have because um, it's, it's a pretty simple form of legal entity, but it also creates um, unlike the unlike the general partnership and the uh, sole proprietorship, unlike the business certificate DBA, you um, are creating an extra layer between you and your personal assets. So, in other words, if I always say, if you're serving food to the public, definitely get a corporation, uh, either an LLC or an S corp. If you are um, in some instances, like I was in a general partnership as a tour operator, we created custom, custom itineraries for travelers coming to the Hudson Valley. It was for individuals and groups. And the risk was really with groups because these were group tours. And if anything happened, um, whether you know they ate in a restaurant and got sick or whether there was something happening on the road, um, the way our society is built with the, there, there's a lot of you know um, lawsuits and they would they would sue everyone they would sue you know the bus driver the bus company the tour operator just everyone so we both owned houses had kids we didn't want um to we wanted to create as much security for ourselves so what we did is rather than investing in a legal entity um, that would have created a, an extra separation between our personal assets and the business, we invested in liability insurance that would cover us if there was a lawsuit. So we had insurance, which I encourage everyone to have business liability insurance, uh, but we doubled it or tripled it, whatever it was. We, we got this a crazy amount so that if anything happened, we would be covered. And it was not double by getting double coverage either. So this is something you may want to think about in the back of your mind. So, all right, so you need to file a certificate of incorporation um, with the New York Department of State. And when you will get this um, document as a PDF, there, there's, a, there's a link here, Division of Corporations. So if you want to know if your business lane has been taken, you will have, um, access to that database and you could put the name in it and it'll tell you whether that name has been taken or not. Um, okay, so somebody raised a hand. I just don't know how to respond to that person. You may wanna either unmute or put your question in the chat. I just don't know how to get to you. I just saw hand raised and that's it. I don't know. Um, I apologize for that, but you can again, write in the chat box or unmute yourself. Um, S corporations usually are about 850. Um, I really encourage you to use an attorney it, unless um, I just see a lot of people uh, using legal Zoom or or doing it themselves. And I, I kid you not, it's it's fixing something that's been done wrong costs more than doing it right the first time. So just keep that in mind. Um, it can be one to three weeks if you have all the documents that they need. So it's pretty quick, but it's not a day like, um, like filing a DBA at the county clerk's office. And um, who can apply? Individual US citizens or uh, legal residents? And um, the owners are called shareholders. And um, there is a, it's limited liability to shareholders. So that's what I meant by you have, you extra, um, you have this extra layer of uh, protection. So um, someone's asking, is the 850 fee for an S Corp including the attorney? And the answer is yes. 
So people love limited liability companies or LLC because it says in it limited liability, but it's no different from an S Corp and an LLC. They're both limited liability company. They create an extra layer between you and your personal assets with something happen. You are still personally liable to the debt and that has been taken for the business because you're, you know, you're usually um, signing for it. So that it's not that type of limited liability. Um, you need to file the articles of the organization, which um, again is with the New York State Department of State. And that is about 1500 with the help of an attorney. Less if you don't need an attorney, but LLC is a little more complex than S Corp to create. And a lot of people think that um, they've done it when they haven't done all the steps and they don't have a legal entity when they think they do. So um, again, do it once, do it right and get the help you need. Again, one to three weeks, depending on how it works. And regardless of the type of legal entity you have, whether you have a DBA, NLC, S Corp, you need insurance. You will need liability and business liability insurance because of the world we live in. Sometimes it's mandatory. You will not be able to lease a space unless you have business liability insurance. Sometimes um, you won't be able to go to trade shows or whatever. You just, it's just something you need because of the nature of the world we live in, which is very litigious. Um, who can create an LLC? Any person or business entity. So sometimes um, some business entities will create an LLC. They'll create, say, a real estate holding. Um, for the building, and then they'll that will hold that will hold the company that will lease from themselves. Basically, it's left hand, right hand, but it's two legal entities. So basically, if you have a restaurant, I always say, and you want to buy a building, I always say um, create a different company that would be a real estate holding, and lease it to the restaurant. Why? Because if something happens, um, you know, I'm always thinking somebody gets, you know, you you buy chicken your provider was not careful and the chicken, you know, made your patrons sick. And now you have a lawsuit with 30 people that got sick. You, um, your restaurant might suffer, but you're not going to lose the business, the, the building. Okay. So it's really an extra layer when you have assets. I hope that makes sense. Um, you can have an unlimited number of members. And um, what costs money, and that's why it's more expensive than an S-Corp, is that you need an operating agreement that has to be crafted in such a way that, make, that makes sense. And you need an attorney for that. Or I really encourage you to get an attorney for that. How's that? Um, limited liability to members, like, um, like an S-Corp, but you know, they're not called members, they're called shareholders. Um, so remember that, um, if this was a really fast overview of a bunch of basic stuff that you need to know, but every situation is unique, right? Every person has its own personal idea and every situation is unique. So take full advantage of the fact that you can get one-on-one -on -one business counseling um, at no cost to you with your local SBDC, which will probably be the Mid-Hudson if you're in the Mid-Hudson region. Um, we have offices in every county, not that we're doing in-person meetings right now, but eventually we will again, uh, we're doing virtual. So um, take full advantage of that. So I will include that link to this email that I'll send you uh, when I get your, your, uh, the list of folks that signed up for tonight. Um, I'll also have a link with a survey and I understand we're all surveyed out. I get surveys every day. I'm like, oh my God, this one is literally like three or four questions. And our, um, sponsors, the SBA wants us to have a survey. So please fill it out. That's how they know we're real. And, um, this is another good opportunity. We have 15 minutes 
to if you want to ask any questions we can open mics uh we can have uh you know an informal conversation i know some people like just joined us um i want you guys to know that this session has been recorded it will be sent to you um to listen at your leisure um i will send you the pdf of this presentation um and we will have you know three more sessions like these that will allow us to um, go a little more in depth. And you have a little homework, so don't get off yet. Even if you don't have questions, I have a little homework for you for next session. So the little homework is if you have a business idea, that's great. Um, if you don't have a business idea, think of one because what we're doing at the next session is exploring um, basically the trends, business trends. And I really want you to have some sort of an idea of what you'd like to do so that we can compare it with, you know, it may not have changed. Your business idea might be um, no different to execute whether it was today in 2021 or five years ago or five years from now, or it may have changed dramatically in the last year. And then it's like, how do you wrap your brain around it because things are so different. So that's why I have that session because things are different and in many instances, and we have to really think outside the box to accommodate um, either the industry or the, the times we're in or just um, purchasing decisions that have changed tremendously. I mean, just look at yourself, how different it is now than it was a year ago. Um, there are a lot of things that changed and they may not change forever, but they will definitely impact us for a while. Um, someone asked if their 14 year old uh, child can have an LLC and the answer is no, you have to be 18 and over in order to have a legal entity. So unfortunately you cannot um, have a minor file uh, a legal entity. That is a good question. This is time for you guys to um, ask a question. Raymond, I know you raised your hand. I just don't know how to make you talk. Yeah, I, sorry, I couldn't find the chat box. Thank you so much for the information. My question is, can an S corporation hold multiple DBAs? Yes, good okay. question. Not LLCs, but S corp. So oftentimes they have an S corp, Companies that have multiple businesses may have an S corp, and then we'll have a DBA for this one, a DBA for that one, a DBA for that one. So let's say if you have a restaurant with multiple, uh, you know, like three, four restaurants, it would be one corporation and different DBAs. An LLC cannot have a DBA, but an S corp can. But what if you have a, a business, like suppose a, a, a food business, okay? And I want to go into clothing or I want to go into handicrafts. So would I still do an S Corp and DBA or would I have to have one for each? You product? need, okay, that's a really good question. So if you have a food product and you're doing uh, clothing, clothing, so do you need different types of legal entities? And usually because there are different codes, they are, there are industry codes. They're called NICS code, N as in, um, I forget what N stands for. Anyway, N-A-I-C-S. If you Google that, N-A-I-C-S, you Google NICS code uh, for clothing and there'll be a bunch of codes that are gonna come up and, and the same thing with food. Because each have their own code, usually um, when you file your taxes, that code will be on your taxes. So to answer your question is that you're better off with different legal entities, even if it's just a DBA, because otherwise, your accountant's going to scratch his or her head and go, what's going on here? What am I putting? What are you doing? Are you a food manufacturer or a retail or, or a, a tailor? Mm -hmm. So thank you, Sylvia. Next, next stands for the North American Industry Classification System Codes. So um, that's what it stands for. Uh, or, an, or SIC code, but now it's more commonly used in NAIC code. Um, Someone asked, I have an investment property that is paid outright. Would it be wise to enter that investment property into an LLC? If that property is a commercial property and you're leasing to tenants or to yourself as a business, it would be a wise idea. Um, again, talk to your accountant 
first. There are taxation um, issues you might want to be aware of and, and then make that decision. Hello, my name is Digna. I'm just a little confused. I'm opening a pizzeria and I actually registered my business as LLC and I am just having difficulty getting the permit from the city because they want me to know how I'm doing business, the DBA, doing business as of um, certificate. I'm confused because I don't know, I already have the LLC, but they asking me again, to identify how I want to be known or how I'm doing business. So I'm just not connecting and I've been trying to get a permit, but I'm still on hold. What city is this? New York. New York City. So um, so the thing with, with um, what type of business is it? Pizzeria. Pizzeria, okay. So the, the thing with bureaucracies, and I say this nicely, I mean, it's, it's not, you know, I'm not trying to not be nice, but they, the bureaucracies are like, they feed a monster, they feed a monster that needs paper, right? So they require a lot of information. And they, behind that is a person whose job is to make sure that you have provided said information. So they have check boxes. They have to check, 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 check before they can give you the permit. So one of the things um, you want to do is try to see if you can get a hold of that person and say, listen, I'm not sure what you're asking me because I'm giving you the LLC. I don't have a DBA. I'm not doing business as anything. I'm doing business as my LLC. So what else do you need from me? I already have contacted him twice. I don't know what to tell you, but we do have SBDCs in New York. And, you know, beyond, because I'm not familiar with New York City, um, I'm in the Hudson Valley. Um, if you have an advisor in New York, they would understand this sort of problem and be familiar with it and probably know a workaround. So I really encourage you to reach out to um, the website that I... Um, yes, please. I definitely... Where is it? Uh, I, have, I, have, I don't I, know where I put it, but anyways, I, 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 I'll send you the link and then you can put um, requests for counseling and given your zip code, you'll be assigned an advisor in your area. Oh, thank you very much because I did reach out and I sent some emails. Nobody has responded yet and I've been doing that already two months. Okay. Well, then we have a resource guide that you can access by going to www sba.gov and it will give you a listing of all the SBDCs in New York from Ulster County down to Richmond. So if you're in New York City, whichever county you're in, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, or Staten Island, we have somebody there for you. Trust me. I, I have reached out. I sent a few emails. I have called in. Nobody has not responded to me and I don't know why. I've been I need trying to this know for two months. That was, just reach out to me. And I, okay. because I reviewed Can you give it. me your information? So I definitely will. I will put it in the chat, mama. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Two. There are no bad questions. None. I, I just may not have the answer. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> I don't have all the answers. Um, so the question tonight is, is any of the information shared tonight available in other languages? Unfortunately, um, I, we don't have like a translator, like, you know, it's not like this session can be automatically, automatically translated. We don't have that as a feature. Um, but again, if you want one-on-one -on -one business counseling in your language, we have advisors that speak different languages, like I speak French and there are others that speak Spanish, Chinese, um, all kinds of languages. And we can find someone to help you, um, hopefully in your language of, of need. Thank you. Sorry. Any other questions before we wrap up? Oh, so yeah, don't forget your homework. 
You have two weeks to think of a business idea or two if you don't have one. Um, and then we'll review business trends. We'll talk about how we can um, pivot, transition, reform, reformulate the old to the new. Thank you, very informative. I really enjoyed it and learned a lot today. I'm glad, thank Excellent. you. So just I know Chris from the library again, I just want to thank you all again for attending tonight, for signing up, um, and to thank our presenters again. You're welcome, everyone. Yes, Thanks. thank you, everyone, for attending. This was a great session. We have a great team. We're here to help you. No matter what your business idea may be, we're here to help guide you, help you start, help you grow, help you expand. And God forbid, should you have a problem, we'll help you recover. Thank you. Thank you. You don't have to do this alone. It's really hard. It's really hard to start a business. It's really hard to do it alone. And oh my God, you're so true. That is so true. I've been thinking, sitting like this, going around in circles for the past couple of years now. It's really hard to do it alone. So um, get help, you know, especially if this is free. So take full advantage of it. What you should also know is that most businesses do not succeed past five years without the proper guidance. And I'm like maybe 24% of businesses make it to five years. Whereas if you have a business counselor guiding you, your chances increase to 76 to 80% to make it past five years. So absolutely, we are here to help you at no additional cost. Your tax dollars at work. Thank so you. to take an example, my tea manufacturer that I've been on and off their advisor for 10 years, they started in their garage. And now they have uh, 30,000 square feet with 30 employees and growing fast. What do they do? What do they do? They're um, tea packers. Oh. So, um, so, yeah, in a nutshell. But, you know, they started a one person in a garage, like, I want to do this. And now they're, you know, fully operational and doing two shifts a day, soon three. So it's, it's, it's possible. You just, it, it takes a time. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of work. But again, like Sylvia was doing, um, do it, you know, don't do it alone because you, it's hard. So um, is it possible to have the leaders email? So that would be Sylvia, myself, Ellen, and the Newberg Free Library. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a problem with that. We can certainly, um, does anyone have any problem with that, Ellen, or? Not at all. Oh, that's I fine. I wasn't sure if we were going to send a follow-up after tonight's session, so maybe we can put all of our email, our contact information. Yeah, I'll, I'll be sending out a follow-up tonight with um, the recording and with all the information, like the PowerPoint and uh, our contact information. Thank you. Okay, so you'll send the power. I'll send you the information, Chris, and you'll just send it to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. And I'll copy the three of you on it too, just so you. Perfect. Excellent. That sounds great. I just want to say thank you to everybody, Chris. Thank you so much for allowing us the use of your platform, Ellen. Great, great, great teamwork, ladies, and Miriam. That was amazing. I really appreciate all the help and the teamwork, and we're here to help you. So let's do this again. Yes. See you in weeks. It's a couple weeks. All right. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Stay warm. Have a good night. Stay safe and well. Bye, everyone. Thank you. You're very welcome. What a day, what a day. And we should have some music to let us go out. Less than a minute left. I was in a Zoom recently where they played like starting music and closing music. It was kind of neat. It is. I do that every Wednesday morning, eight o'clock in the morning with the Mount Vernon Chamber of Commerce in the Bronx SBDC. And we even have a little stretching thing where we have uh, one of the businesses called Specialty Fitness. Yeah. At Give us a little stretching with your hands because everybody's behind a computer. And oh, that's so it. smart. <laughs> it's brilliant, brilliant. And I look forward to just that moment. <laughs> so Yeah, we've been doing um, chair yoga now and people are loving it because people are home all day 
and it helps them, you know, with the ergonomics of sitting around and, you know. Yes, because my back is saying, oh, no, no. Oh, oh mine too, mine too. <laughs> well, have a great night, Sylvia, and great night, everyone else who attended. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and we will see you all in two weeks. Take care, all. Bye.